Excellent. Okay. Hi, folks. If you're joining us for our event with Stephen Graham Jones, you're in the right place. We're going to get started in just a moment. Uh, while you are getting settled, I wanted to say hello and greetings. I'm Carr Johnson. I'm the events coordinator for Green Apple Books here in San Francisco, California. Um, a quick heads up to y'all that unfortunately Lee Francis IV won't be able to join us this evening. He'll be missed. Um, and in his stead, I would like to say please check out his shop as well as his work. Um, but do check out Red Planet Books and Comics in Albuquerque. Uh, it's the only native comic shop in the world. And I will link to the store in the chat here uh, in just one moment. So you can check that out and support Lee and what they're doing at Red Planet. While you're in the chat too, you can go ahead and say hi and tell us where you are tuning in from. We always love to know that. Also like to tell you about a couple of events that we have coming up at Green Apple. First, uh, on this coming Wednesday, November 10th at 6 p.m. Pacific time, we're gonna be joined by Benita Blackburn and Gloria Deem, who are gonna be talking about their books, How to Wrestle a Girl and On Girlhood, 15 Stories from the Well-Read Black Girl Library. It's gonna be a really special celebration uh, with Benita and Glory. It's gonna be centering black girlhood, storytelling and love of literature. And we really can't wait to be able to host them online. So you can join us as well. That's gonna be this coming Wednesday, November 10th at 6 p.m. Pacific time. We do have a full calendar of our events on our website and most of our events are free unless stated otherwise. So that being said, I'm not above it please do buy books if you are able. Please do buy them from us if you are able. Uh, if you've been here before, you have heard me say that when you buy books from us, it not only supports um, us as a store and helps us put on events such as these, but you also support the authors who put so much work into making these books and then you get a book out of it, which might be the most important part of all. So if you can, please do. I'm going to link to Stephen's book here in the chat as well, so you can check that out. I also wanted to let you folks know that we do have a Q&A at the end of the hour, so anytime you have a question, you can go ahead and enter it into the Q&A box on the bottom of your screen, and we'll get to as many as we can. Do not be shy. We, we love questions, so uh, keep them coming, and again, we'll get to as many as we can at the end of the hour. Um, without further ado, I'd like to go ahead and introduce the author joining us this evening. Stephen Graham Jones is the author of 30 or so books. Most recently, My Heart is a Chainsaw, The Only Good Indians, Night of the Mannequins, Mongrels, and Mapping the Interior. Originally from Midland, Texas, Jones now lives in Boulder, Colorado, and his latest book, Memorial Ride, is the reason that we are here today. So please join me in welcoming Stephen Graham Jones. Hey, Stephen. Hey, thank you. Thanks for having me. Of course. Thank you. Um, did you want to start us off with an excerpt from Memorial Ride? Sure, I will. And I'll set it up a little bit first, too. Um, I'm bringing you in on, I guess, part two. It's, it's, a, it's a book with four parts. Each kind of is a standalone or an, an episode, an issue. And they're, they're all like comic floppy size, too. So it adds up to, I don't know, 88 pages, I guess. Mm -hmm. And so the main character is a guy named Coopertown. He's in the military, he's deployed over in Afghanistan. He comes home to Oklahoma for his father's funeral. He gets a um, release for what, two days, three days. And um, it's just an excuse for him to really, see, it's an excuse to see his girlfriend because he and his father are estranged. They did not care for each other. So it's really just a way to see his girlfriend, Sherry Moon. And while they're, well, Coopertown, while he's there, he inherits his father's old Harley that his dad was always leaving on. And he and Sherry stop by a drugstore just to, to get something and run afoul of the John Wayne gang, this, um, these, you know, drugstore stick up artists pretty much. And it becomes a chase instantly. And they got that bike. So they take off. They're burning across Oklahoma, New Mexico, up into Colorado. And the John Wayne gang is chasing them. The DPS is after them. They're on the news. The, it's a, it's, it's a race, you know? So this is in uh, chapter two and part two. And I'm going to try to share my, I'm going to share my screen and it, you know doing a reading from a comic book is a weird thing um it like uh, I've seen people and in, in, in when you're physically there throw them up on the screen behind you so I'm just going to throw, throw it up on the screen in front of you here and we were going to have Lee here and Lee was bringing some um images that uh, 
from the comic book that I was going to kind of, I don't know, kind of read the dialogue for and the, and the captions for and the sound effects for, he was going to give us the art without the lettering in it. But, um, but so I don't have that art, but it's really kind of better now that I think about it because I need the words. I don't know what to say. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, so um, I'm going to share a screen with you and I'm going to um, walk you through some of this. It's five pages, I think, maybe six. All right, here goes. Let's see if this works. All right, y'all can, you can see it, Count Car. All right, Memorial Ride. First of all, man, we gotta give credit to Maria Wolf for that cover. That is a killer cover. That is excellent. I'd like to have that tattooed on my whole back, you know, if I ever had that much time. <laughs> um, all right, Memorial Ride. This is, we're in part two, some rides you have to make. And that's, that's Cooperstown right there and Sherry Moon back there. And that's a Mustang they end up in. So, Albuquerque, 286 miles per miles away. Thought it was one down, three up. Clank, clank, scrunch. He doesn't really know how to drive his father's Harley. <laughs> wanted by the authorities. Probably wanted by the bad guys. Honk, honk, honk. You think I can't cut that mustache out by the roots? I was doing it perfect earlier. Neither is going to look good for the court martial board. What? I can't hear you. I said, does my hair really look like that? Like on the news? And there they are in the news, armed, they're, they're considered part of the armed robbery thing. Your, your hair looks good, it always looks good. It's hair, I mean, zip. So you knew him, that other soldier? This is the soldier that got shot during that um, drugstore heist. His name was Streep. Third, no, fourth, 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 fourth. He was thirsty. So he had to pee a lot. Five minutes, they're in Tucumcari, New Mexico. Not if we go to, through the same door, soldier boy, and lock it. He's considering this. We may not live to see tomorrow. I mean, we need to get that three grand. Baseball, 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 baseball. Baseball terms, go, foul ball, home run, rounding second base. He's going to make it. He's sliding in the home. He's safe. That's um, um, that's the DPS officer that is after, is after him. Coop. Sherry's already got a knife ready. Listen, I was there. I know what really happened at that drugstore. Trust me, these John Waynes, they aren't taking any prisoners. Safest place for you two is in the back of my car. Whoa, take your easy there, Pilgrim. Don't you know, Cabrera? Out here, due process is a bullet. Marion, is that you? I swear, if you don't, you'll arrest me. Right on the report that twice in one day, somebody got the drop on you. You've been watching the news again, haven't you? Mox and Telegraph, Chica. You best get on that bad mo motorcycle there, Pilgrim. I can't hold this one much longer. Jail here, jail there, or $3,000. They're going to sell the Father's Harley in New Mexico. Kid, listen, the John Waynes, they're painting the walls with people back there. You seriously pissed them off. You don't want kid? He can fly 10,000 miles across the ocean, shoot people he doesn't know, people he has to live with in his head now, and you still call him kid? I don't know who you think you're talking to, Miss Moon. Sit down, Marion. I like how Maria was able to spray that particulate matter, like do it with a pencil, I don't know how she did that. I don't, I don't think you know who you're talking to, Miss Culebra. That means snake, yeah. Cabrera, actually, it means goat herder. Coop, let's go get our money. What do you call a young, stupid goat who needs hurting? Kid. But you're just done with your father's funeral. Nothing makes you feel like a kid so much as thinking about your dad. Nothing makes you feel like a kid so much as having one. From a jail cell or a brig, if you're lucky. If you're not, another funeral, another flag. And they're burning off into the rest of the story. And that's Memorial Ride. I'll stop this share. That last slide went a little bit awry. It was supposed to like pop up individually, but I made this slideshow at the very last minute, so I messed it up. <laughs> but thank you all for That's indulging me. That was, that was fun to read through. I'm not very good with voices. I'm not a voice actor, but I do know these characters anyways. Yes, that came through. Um, thanks so much for, for sharing that. I love that excerpt, especially because it shows how much of a badass Sherry Moon is. Um, yeah. And uh, I'd, I'd love to hear first, just like where the, where the story for Memorial Ride came from. Um, it's kind of, it's yeah. outside of the yeah. horror genre, but it's still like really gripping yeah. and like propulsive. 
Yeah, and those are some of, so those are some of my favorite stories. I love stories mm-hmm. that just like hit the ground running and just don't stop running. Those are my favorite kind, you know. And about shoot, this is probably four years ago in the summer. For some reason, I don't know why, I like fell into a John Wayne hole where I had mm-hmm. to like read everything I could on John Wayne and just watch so many of those cowboy movies. And I mean, I think anytime that you like um are trying to engage like the myth or the legend of John Wayne, what you're really doing is like you're facing up to America, you know, because I think he kind of stands for America in some weird way Um, and not a very comfortable way to natives, of course, because we're always in his movies. We're like disposable, you know, we're in the background and we're usually not even played by ourselves. Um, um, So I just, I was, I was just inhaling so much John Wayne that I finally had to spit it back out or I finally had to like push back against it, I guess. And so what I wanted to do here was um, uh, in my initial um, conception of this story, I had um, these John Wayne gang members all wearing John Wayne masks, but I didn't anticipate that that's hell to draw. You know, who wants to draw John Wayne's face four times and make each of those individual and then carry that through, through panel after panel. So, so um, we settled on, you know, the, 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 outlaw mask, the train robber, you know, the bandanas, which worked, worked fine. And a different reason for them to be called the John Wayne gang, which was fun as well. But yeah, I just wanted to, I wanted to come at John Wayne in some fashion, which is kind of why, you know, the first three parts like end with a quote by one of his characters. And um, who, I mean, who knows, I mean, what can you really do to John Wayne finally? I mean, I can hit him in the shin a whole lot of times. And I guess I'll just keep doing that through my whole career, probably. You know, I'm in my first novel, The Fast Red Road, which was 2000, it's 21 years ago now, I guess. The biggest argument I had with a copy editor was why won't I capitalize the word America? And I didn't like that a capital letter made it important, you know? And so I think that I'm still doing the same thing 21 years later. I'm still trying to uncapitalize America. And that's what Memorial Ride is angling to do anyways yeah that absolutely comes through and i'm i'm so glad i was absolutely going to ask you about the john wayne gang uh but i'm so it's so interesting to me that the like story itself is kind of pushing up against john wayne in like this way that's like this uh like road epic right like kind of a modern road epic which is like outside of John Wayne's purview, but totally in his legacy, you know? Um, And he's this kind of like, you know, I think the the naming of the gang is, uh, the John Wayne gang is clearly culturally significant. He's this like clownish cowboy figure of like colonization and masculinity and whiteness. And um, what was interesting to me is in the, I'm also going to do my best to not to not spoil the story, but in the first mention of them says that there are these kind of like shadowy figures or urban legends come to mm-hmm. life, uh, which is interesting mm-hmm. as we're kind of introduced to them in this almost like perfectly human situation um, where they're like mm-hmm. robbing a liquor store, which we see does ramp up and they are kind of like a little more sinister than than that. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's actually like Coop's super super soldier and Sherry Moon's uh, actions that kind of make them have the larger than life or like supernatural urban legend come to life as yeah. opposed to the John Wayne yeah. folks. Yeah. 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 And I mean, yeah, talking about them is like a folklore and action or something mm-hmm. or an urban legend. Um, the, the big mystery with them so far is that they seem to just strike here and then there hundreds of miles away and they they turn to smoke after they leave and Mm -hmm. so the authorities and the press can't figure out how are they doing this is it the same is it actually the same people is it different people and same masks what's going on you know Mm -hmm. and coop of course um not on purpose but he does get to the bottom of that mystery Mm -hmm. (laughs) yeah in his own like very like human way but in this way that he's like very much trained to trained to do um I'm I'm curious too that uh your writing is your writing is usually so cinematic and really Mm -hmm. like lush in description and what was it like working working with an artist to kind of make that come to life as opposed to using like a really close like third person narration or or something yeah 
No, it's completely different, of yeah. course. Um, but however, when I wrote this script for Memorial Ride, I didn't have an artist and I actually had no, um, like I, I didn't think it would ever get, get drawn, you know? So for me, the script at the time I wrote it back in like 2016 or whenever it was, was the final um, version. And so therefore I spilled all the description I could into each panel. I kind of overwrote each panel. Like, um, and Mar Maria was so cool that she was able to take like the act actually crucial elements out of all my overwordy descriptions and actually just draw that, you know, or to mm. erase a lot of my words and do it with art instead, mm. which is of course what, what an artist can do and does in a comic book situation. But um, if I if I had been with, working with her from the get-go, the script would have been a whole lot more skeletal. I would have just mm. ba basically done story beats and dialogue, I think. I probably wouldn't have, like in, in the script as it is now, I, um, break down the, the the page's layout and then the tiers and the individual panels and sometimes the angles that stuff is gonna be from and just all kinds of stuff. I go way too granular, which is to say it kind of um, is using the artist like a, a a hand I have that happens to be able to draw, you know, which is not no way to use an artist. An artist needs room to move. They need they need like a general sense of what's happening and they can make it come to life in ways that you could never guess as the writer because I don't really have that visual imagination that instinct either mm -hmm. but um so it was really cool that Maria was able to break the script down and just pull the essential stuff out and disregard the rest because there's a lot of rest you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's so that's really interesting too that they that you kind of have to like overwrite it and then then let her into it right um how did you two get paired together you know um it was through lee uh, lee could probably tell that story better than i can but um i first met her i think it was on a zoom call like like mm. this and and we were just both in our studies in our houses and we talked a little bit about you know, what we saw is the potential of this project. And of course I was, I looked at some of the samples of her art and mm -hmm. she can draw some killer werewolves. And I figure anyone who can draw killer were werewolves is great for me to work with. <laughs> <laughs> that's really, that's, um, it's, it's a really good pairing of like the art and the story. It really works out. Um, and if you can draw a werewolf, you can draw a John Wayne mask, you know? <laughs> um, in your in your script for Memorial Ride, you included um, some visual cues for Maria to like um, Jonah Hex um, or mm -hmm. a 1981 shovelhead yeah. motorcycle uh, yeah. Ghost Rider. Were there other yeah. inspirations that you had kind of breadcrumbs left for her? You know, I did in the script in the script that I gave her. Mm -hmm. I had um, well, number one where the final confrontation takes place on a certain part of the highway. Um, I've been across that highway so many mm -hmm. times that I feel like I know it. But one of my times through there, I stopped and took a whole lot of pictures so, so that so that mm -hmm. she could know like what the mountain does on this side of the road and what, what the land looks like if you look down the road that way. And just um, which you know, maybe that's helpful, maybe it's overkill, I don't know. But yeah, I sent her a lot of pictures of like just Google image search, you know, products of um like the motorcycle and different cars and emblems and stuff like that and i did also for the covers for each individual you know issue or chapter or part um i would suggest iconic covers from ghost rider from spider-man from mm -hmm. other stuff and i did that also for some of the pages you know let's say i want this to work like when um when peter parker has too much stress and there's like pie wedges coming off him or all pointing at him with, you know, mm -hmm. this with Aunt May up here and Jonah Jameson over here and the vulture over here, that kind of stuff, you know? And, and I mean, she, of course, doesn't probably, she probably doesn't need me to say this is like Spidey 76 or anything. <laughs> she probably has that all, all on file in her head, <laughs> but that's how I envision it anyways. And so that's the only like um, mechanism I've got to deliver it with. Mm -hmm. That's a, a collaboration right there. Um, the I was gonna I was gonna ask I I tried looking into it, but was this serialized before? It, it was not. No, I wanted yeah. to fake like it was serialized with the covers and the issues and everything. It worked. But I wanted to pretend. Like, thank you, thank you. <laughs> I wanted to pretend like it was a a trade version of a four issue limited series. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I think that's really interesting because I because I I hadn't 
thought so and then there's you know like the mm-hmm. recap at the beginning of each part yeah. and so I was curious yeah. if it came out um in serialized yeah. volumes I'm curious what was the inclination for that I just I thought it was a fun game to play mostly but um <laughs> I love the I love the like, challenge of having to do those recaps those recaps mm-hmm. are not easy to mm-hmm. I mean to summer to like pull out just the the mountain peaks of the last issue and try to um, deliver them in such a way that someone who didn't read that last issue can be contextualized enough to hit this story at issue three and keep going, you know? Yeah. So it was, it's a, it's a big challenge. It was really fun for me to do as well. Oh, I'm really glad because, well, one, you got me. I really was like, <laughs> I, I had no idea. Um, <laughs> And two, I was like actively thinking that while I was reading it, I was like, this is a, a exercise in economy. Like, I don't know how you did this. <laughs> um, so that's cool. It worked out. Um, I wanted to, I wanted to talk a little bit about Cooper Town. Um, and uh, I think Coop is a really, really interesting uh, hero we have here. Um, mm-hmm. Specifically, um, I wanted to talk about like his being a like native service member. I want to talk mm-hmm. a little bit about um, his dad, this being like a father son story. Mm-hmm. And um, there's a, a blog review from Sherry Sondheimer that commented on Coop's PTSD. And it says here, quote, this country has done everything it can to destroy people that were here long before it was deliberately establishing conditions that perpetuate cycles of abuse that in turn feed their war machine that in turn return soldiers scarred by PTSD who receive no Mm -hmm. treatment and then in turn perpetuate cycles of abuse. Um, And that really all ties together with like Coop's dad being a veteran and um, his then enlisting in the military despite his dad's wishes. Yeah, like Coop's dad, that's that's his worst nightmare is for his son to follow the same path he took, you know, yeah. which I don't mean to cast bad light on the military, but it's it's just what that um that blog post by Sonham was saying that um the soldiers are utilized while they're enlisted and then just often pushed to the side afterwards, you know, and that doesn't seem like very good treatment of uh, people. And yes, um Coop's dad does, you know, suffer from that for sure, I would say. And, you know, I wonder if, um, now that I think about it, there's, Bruce Springsteen has, um, you know, his song, The River, which is amazing. There's a live version of it you can find on YouTube and probably on one of his live albums or something as well. It's like an 11 minute version. The song is maybe four minutes long, five minutes mm-hmm. long, but he does this long intro for it about um, he and his dad's battles, like uh, through high school, mm-hmm. like the dad saying, cut your hair, you know, be, be better. The army is gonna make a man out of you, all that kind of stuff. And this is kind of spoiling it. I feel bad for spoiling it, but I think you can listen to this story 500 times and it still it still hits you in the gut as it should because Bruce Springsteen is an amazing storyteller. But at the end of it, Bruce Springsteen goes to take his physical because he got drafted and he fails mm-hmm. his physical and he comes home and tells his dad, I failed. And he thinks it's going to be one more thing his dad puts on the wall, like this is another way he failed me. And his dad says, good. You know, his dad mm-hmm. does not want his son to go over to Vietnam. Mm-hmm. And um. That's, a, that's the same place Coop's dad is coming from. He doesn't want his his son to do exactly what Coop ends up doing just to get away from his dad. His dad is doing things for like loving reasons, but his expression of them or his implementation of them only served to push Cooper exactly where he doesn't want Cooper to go, you know? Mm-hmm. And, um, and, but you know, the simpler answer for, why he's military, why he's native is that um, I grew up, my dad is in the Air Force, you know? And so mm-hmm. that's just the world I grew up in. That's, that's, that's what mm-hmm. I know, you know? Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's um, really, it's uh, it's really interesting. It's also just like his, his kind of tenacity and um, thinking on his feet and like all of this military training that he has in him is like, um, kind of it seems like it's kind of part of uh I mean this is an action story so he's gonna have Mm. that right but uh it's Mm. kind of a part of like a larger like survival like you know in his life with his dad prior to and um then now post-military in these very high pressure situation that he ends up in yeah 
for sure. But also, I mean, Coop, he's he's already he was already in the brig, you know, when he was deployed because mm -hmm. he punched out his commanding officer. And then what he does to one of the John Waynes in the drugstore is punch him out, you know. So mm -hmm. he he needs to learn to express himself without violence, ideally. You know, mm -hmm. um, he has things to learn. And he also talking father sons. You know, he starts out estranged from his father. Maybe not even estranged. He just doesn't count his father anymore. His father's not part of his consideration. Mm -hmm. um, but by the end of the story, he has, like, he comes home for his father's funeral, which is an excuse. But by the end of the story, he um, ideally would have reconciled a little bit with his father's memory or his father's shadow anyways. Mm -hmm. Because, um, well, I don't want to spoil anything. Yeah, I guess I'll stop there because I don't want to spoil anything. <laughs> <laughs> you know he doesn't really um he doesn't really get a moment to grieve in the story until yeah. the end because he's kind of in a pressure cooker from the beginning he is yeah that's that's my uh, i think you know character is the best when they're in a pressure cooker and so i'll just try to keep that water boiling and pressuring it up as much as i can yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um i think it's safe to say without giving too much away that um mm -hmm. this is a story of vengeance to a certain degree that vengeance yeah. plays a part yeah. in this story yeah. um i wanted to point out to again without giving too much away um on page 77 i don't know if you have the book in front of you but i'll, I'll pick it up excellent um on page 77 um there's uh now what you said earlier about uh pushing against john wayne is kind of it's all coming coming out here for me um there's like kind of a parallel between coop and these john wayne characters and his movies like seeking a fight or seeking revenge i was wondering if you could talk talk about that a little bit this drawing a parallel well i mean i think we all know that um like in a society of blood feuds everyone ends up dead and that's what's what blood feud, blood feuds are vengeance you know or mm -hmm. or how, how do they say it um in a world of an eye for an eye everyone ends up blind mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. um, and um that is the john wayne gang is definitely they definitely are out for vengeance or what they would consider justice on mm -hmm. coop and sherry moon and so coop and sherry moon are running of course and um but then in the final confrontation, yes, it kind of the tables, they're not necessarily turned, but um, it's not all about their vengeance anymore. It's it, it's also a little bit about Coop and Sherry's justice or revenge. Mm -hmm. You know, I think justice and revenge are often very similar depending on where you're looking from, you know? Um, very fair. <laughs> but you know, it's funny on page 77, that's I think my favorite panel of the whole mm. whole book, that top right panel, it's a, it's a mm. dog like protecting its fallen owner and I love mm. that because the dog there's like Maria put shake lines around him motion lines around that dog so you can you can almost feel that dog snapping and saying don't come close I'm still protecting totally. this person you know yeah it's a little I'll try without giving too much weight I'll yeah. just give a brief yeah. close-up for the kids at home yeah here. that's good that's top it. left corner I love, it's really I love cool dog. Yeah, yeah it's really cool um yeah, yeah that's probably um I really, I really love this page, this excerpt of the story. Um, I was curious too, just like um, what your what your relationship was to comics and um, yeah. how how Memorial Ride ended up as a comic. I guess when it it maybe could have been taken another form. Yeah, no, I definitely could have got it published mm -hmm. faster if I'd written it as a novella, say, you know, because um, I have like more pipelines to push fiction through mm -hmm. than I do to push comic books through right now, mm -hmm. but. Um, the trick is the comic format or the comic medium for Memorial Ride, it gave me the option or gave me license really to jump the camera from here to there to there. Because comic books, when you turn the page, you kind of expect to be in a different part of the story. Mm -hmm. You don't have to like ease that transition the way you do in prose fiction. You, and in prose fiction, you need a reason to go from here to there. In comic books, it, they, they move, move in a slightly different way. And I needed that different way to tell the story in as economic a fashion as I could. So comics to mm -hmm. me were the right, the right medium, the right delivery method for, you know, for a Memorial Ride. But um, as for me in comics, you know, we lived, I grew up in West Texas, way out in the country. And every two weeks on a Wednesday, um, my mom would load us all into the Suburban and we'd go into town to grocery shop. Mm -hmm. and it was a long old drive and the growth the suburban had a 454 in it so it sucked yeah so we'd have to stop at a gas station halfway to town this lonely gas station out in the middle of nowhere and she'd give each of us kids three quarters and and while she was gassing up we could go inside 
and buy whatever we could for 75 cents. And I always got Dr. Pepper because it's Dr. Pepper, mm -hmm. you know? But one of those times I was traipsing through the cooler at the back of the store and I happened to like brush up against this spinning rack, what turned out to be a spinning rack of comic books. I'd never seen a comic book before. And I was kind of entranced and I stopped, and I looked around at all these amazing covers, all these action covers, these colorful, like garishly colorful co covers. Mm -hmm. And um, I plucked one up and it was Secret Wars number four, I think it was. And Secret Wars number four is hooked on the front. He's holding up like it says, what is it? Nine billion tons of rock or something like that, which is, you know, who knows, who knows how he can do that. But it's amazing. And I had to see how he did that while he was doing that. Mm -hmm. So I bought it and um, I followed as well as I could because I had to go to that same round rack to buy comics. Um, the rest of that limited series went up to 12. And the premise of Secret Wars is um, this cosmic entity who's all powerful from another dimension plucks um Earth's heroes and villains, like selections from heroes and villains, and puts them on this battle planet to see if good or evil wins. And and Doctor Doom is Doctor Doom, the bad guy, is there on the planet, but Doctor Doom doesn't want to be somebody's chess piece. He wants the power that this cosmic ent entity, the Beyonder, has. And so while the heroes and villains are you know pitching battles against each other, Doctor Doom goes after the Beyonder up in the sky, and the Beyonder, being all powerful, just shreds Doom. He just like cuts his leg off and he's tearing him all up terribly but this is i think issue 10 where this happens um doom persists doom pushes through he takes that damage and keeps on going and he finally does snatch that power away that cosmic power away from the beyonder which is mm. amazing and unlikely that's what you get comic books for you know mm. and and all through my high school years um every time i would be in some situation where i was facing adversity I would dial back to issue 10 of Secret Wars to Dr. Doom, taking all that damage and pushing on. And I would say, you know, if Dr. Doom can do it, I can do it. And so I really feel like comic books like saved my life. You know, mm. like if I hadn't had them for a model, uh, who knows what happens to me? I probably give up somewhere along the way. And I've, I've been reading comics ever since that day in this Pecan Grove gas station when I was 12 years old. And I've been just reading as many as I can. I read three comics today, I think. I just got off the new in my new in my bag, you know, at the comic book shop. Um, I've always loved, loved, loved comics. Mm -hmm. And I'm honored to now be getting to work in them. Yeah, yeah that's that's great. What a like beautiful relationship to a medium. That's awesome. Um I was going to ask too. I think it's uh, appropriate. And I will say before I do that, folks, if you have questions do go ahead and enter them into the Q&A we're standing by uh, but Memorial Ride uh, marks the start of the University of New Mexico Press's uh, Red Planet series mm -hmm. that's a collaboration with Red Planet Books and Comics um, which is uh, owned by Lee Francis IV uh, here in Albuquerque or uh, in Albuquerque rather um, how did this project come about what can you tell us about it um, how it came about was I knew some of the people at University of New Mexico Press who were in words and conversation about different things. So I've done, let's see, one book sort of with them. I mean, it did come out with them, but it's only sort of my book. It's um, The Faster Redder Road. It's like a selections from all my stuff. And mm -hmm. Ted Van Alst did it, which, and he did an amazing job. So I figure that's sort of mine. And that's kind of how I got to know the people at New Mexico Press. And uh, so they, I think that they um, were talking to Red Planet. I wish Lee were here. He could document this a lot better. I think they were in talks with Red Planet about, you know, we should work together. We're, we're kind of on the same wavelength and we can, we can do some good stuff. And so they got hold of me and said, said that they were working together. Did I have any projects to pitch them? And conveniently, I'd already had the, I had the script from Memorial Ride already in a PDF. I was just able to bounce it across. And, and, um, they read it they you know with with university presses it's a little bit of a long approval process because they have to send it out for people to to say yes or no to mm -hmm. and um everybody said yes and so it went into production and lee found maria and then lee did the lettering himself too and mm -hmm. which was which is amazing and he did the you know the lettering in the sfx i believe um pretty sure he did the sfx the the sound effects you know the vroom and mm. the bang and all that stuff i love that stuff in comics mm -hmm. and uh maria maria did the pencils the layouts the, the inks and um 
I think she did the coloring too on the cover and the four covers for the mm. individual issues. And, you know, I was at a signing table I don't know, somewhere in the country a week or two ago and somebody brought me Memorial Ride, which I've been signing a lot. And she had started coloring it, you know, and it was really cool the way she was coloring it because it is black and white. So you can color it, you know, it was kind of nice to see. Oh, that's so cool. I didn't, mm -hmm. um, as an aside, I, is that like a, is that kosher or is that like something that comic book readers often do? Like, come, <laughs> no, uh, it's, coloring not, it's, not often, it's not often done. It doesn't yeah. like, um, unless you're like a, unless you're Banksy or something, it probably doesn't up the value of the comic, you know, but, um, but it does personalize it. And I think it's really cool. I think people should do it. Yeah. I like to see like colored versions, you know? Yeah. Oh, that's really cool. Um, I love that. Um, I'll give you, give you one last question on my end here, Stephen. Yeah. Um, this is very exciting. Uh, you recently announced a sequel for My Heart is a Chainsaw um, yeah. called Don't Fear the Reaper. Um, yep. It's coming out next year. Yes, it's coming out um, August 2nd of 22. I'm so excited. Um, that's very cool. Um, do you see Cooper Town and Sherry Moon uh, as characters you may return to in the future? I, I kind of doubt it. I feel like um, their arc in Memorial Ride is complete enough that it would be really cruel of me to pull them into some terrible new adventure where everybody's shooting at them, you know? <laughs> like, I always feel so sorry for John McClane and Die Hard. I'm like, listen, he saved a building. Why does he have to save an airport too? You know, it seems like so mean. And I mean, I know as writers, we're supposed to be cruel to our characters and I try to be cruel to, I mean, I did a lot of terrible stuff to Coop and probably worse stuff to Sherry Moon, mm -hmm. but um, I feel like they kind of um, made it through their ordeal and mm -hmm. for me to like pluck them out of the ether and say it's starting up again it seems kind of mean <laughs> you know but not, not to say you're talking about the sequel to my heart is a chainsaw don't fear the reaper that's what happens in don't fear the reaper you know <laughs> uh, uh it's the um oh man uh it's uh, the the sydney of proof rock um yeah but, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. um well that's um really cool and um i i uh regardless of whether or not you return to these characters is a wonderful standalone story and Thank you. I'm really, Thank you. really glad to have read it um let's uh wrap it up for the evening uh -huh. here this has been really uh -huh. special um i'm so glad uh that we were able to to host you here at green apple and i'm going to show show the folks at home one last time this uh really beautiful book here that you folks mm -hmm. should pick up it's really fun um you and your friends will really love it um i recommend checking it out um thanks so much steven i really appreciate you being here thank you for talking thank you for reading and thank you for being at a bookstore and giving people books you know yeah of course what we do all right <laughs> Until soon, I will see you later. Bye, y'all. Bye.